The Infinite Way by Joel S. Goldsmith with an introduction by John Van Druten published by the Willing Publishing Company San Gabriel, California. This is Joel recording the textbook of our message from the fourth edition of The Infinite Way. Dedicated to you, to whom this already belongs. There is no need to run outside for better seeing, nor to peer from a window. Rather, abide at the center of your being, for the more you leave it, the less you learn. Lao Tse. Truth is within ourselves. There is an inmost center in us all where the truth abides in fullness. And to know rather consists in opening out a way whence the imprisoned splendor may escape than an affecting entry for a light supposed to be without. Robert Browning a God has made his abode within our breast. When he rouses us, the glow of inspiration warms us. This holy rapture springs from the seeds of the divine mind sown in man. Ovid. Most men take a problem not to themselves, not into the chambers of their own minds, but to the first directory of persons whom they can consult, Valdivar. The kingdom of God is within you, Jesus. Introduction Sitting before a blank sheet of paper and wondering what I was going to say by way of introduction to this book, which I know so well, leafing its pages in search of some line or passage which might cue me to a start, I found my thoughts turning away from its contents to the essential mystery of my profession as a writer, the mystery of where they would be coming, those words that I was going to put down, which are already these words that I am putting down. I need hardly say that this was not the first time that I had asked myself that question. It confronts me each time that I find myself with no idea of what I am going to write next, causing me to ask where they have all come from, all those th many thousands of words and thoughts that I have in the past put down on paper to be reproduced in print or on the stage. It is a sort of question that one is apt to ask only in such moments of frustration. For the most part, we take for granted these things that are, in fact, the daily miracles of life, as we take for granted the miracle of growth and germination, scattering seeds in a garden, and never being surprised that from those tiny black specks, next summer's flowers can be relied upon to come. That attitude is one for which G.K. Chesterton was always rebuking the world, for taking its mysteries and its miracles as a matter of course. It is the theme of his too little known fantasy, Man Alive, whose hero was in a state of continual amazement at the miracle of living, and was so eager to keep that amazement alive that he traveled around the world in order to recapture the excitement of coming home to his own house and his own front door 
and courted, eloped with, and remarried his own wife under six different names so as never to lose sight of the incredible wonder of love. It is our tragedy that we live so in a state of acceptance, and yet the essentials of daily living seem to demand it if we are to get on with our business and our work. I use the word seem quite deliberately, for actually the truth, I think, is just the opposite. And what has been called the rich, full life is impossible on such a basis. Even an ordinary, humdrum life is difficult. Its mechanics have a way of breaking down. The hard facts of opposition and mischance, a way of turning into brick walls against which one butts one's head in vain. It is in those moments that men start asking themselves questions about the world they live in and to look for some explanation, help, or sustenance. Religion, the conventional forms of religion, involving a personal God to whom petitionary prayers are addressed, is apt to prove fruitless and to lead to no more than a pious, gloomy resignation and the philosophy of pure materialism, an acceptance of that is the way things are, leads only to a cursing despair. Something else is needed, has always been needed, and has always been there to find, though it would seem that man has almost always missed it. It has eluded him through all the writings of the seekers of the truth about the eternal mystery, from Orientals such as Lao Tse and Shankara, through Jesus, the medieval European mystics, and the thinkers of the New World. Essentially, they have all taught the same things, which is why Aldous Huxley has named his anthology of religious thought the perennial philosophy. But always the answers, as they have been revealed, have remained somehow apart, out there, set off from man in his daily life and the facts of his daily living, so that there has grown up a kind of unfortunate snobbery on the subject, as though it were somehow vulgar to expect tangible or practical results. Man has been forced into a fatal dualism, trying to live on two planes at once, the material and the spiritual, both apparently equally real, yet without any understandable relation to each other, like a firm composed of two partners who are not on speaking terms. That is where, I think, this book goes further removing that duality, showing the two partners to be one only, so that the world becomes one, and the eternal truths are part of the very fabric of our daily life, enhancing its harmonies and erasing its discord. What is this book? Readers today want labels want to know what it is they are buying. But they are apt to be put off by labels, too, which is why I find myself in a difficulty if I try to anticipate that question in relation to this work. Half the world, though it is desperately in need, and even in conscious need of an answer to its problems, will not open a book that is told is a religious one. Give it a title such as How to Get More Health, Wealth, and Happiness. And though an enormous public will buy it, the fastidious and discriminating will avert their heads from it as from a bad odor. Use the word metaphysics, and it has a chilly intellectual sound. Presented as a volume of essays, and we have the reason why Emerson has read 
almost exclusively as literature today, instead of for his answers to the same questions. Can one ever, by any one road, reach all men? The very word God is a deterrent to many. It is all over this book. The instinct that I have to apologize for it is an illustration of my problem in writing this foreword. If it is hard to label the book, it is harder still to label the author. Who and what is Joel Goldsmith? A teacher? A healer? They are suspect and off-putting words at best to all but a very few. And they are the words, too, that I cannot but feel the author himself would vigorously repudiate since his whole philosophy is the denial of any personal element in either teaching or healing. I am reminded of a passage in this book. Always there have appeared men bearing the divine message of the presence of God and the unreality of evil, who brought the light of truth to man. And always men have interpreted this light as the messenger failing to see that what they were beholding as a man out there was the light of truth within their own consciousness. Let me therefore leave both the man and the book for a moment and return to my starting point. In moments of trouble and frustration, man begins to ask questions even if only such questions as, why does this have to happen to me? Or, how can I stop this happening? He looks for an explanation of what the world is about. I believe he will find it here. He hopes that this explanation will act somehow as a cure for his troubles. I believe, too, that if he understands it aright, it will. But here again, I must sound a note of warning. In the very first pages, he will find a paradox which may frighten him. He comes to this quest with a human problem and the hope of a solution for it. He is told that if he wants to use spiritual truth to improve human conditions, it neither can nor will do so. He has shown logically why it cannot. But he is told, too, that if he seeks that truth for its own sake, his human conditions will be improved. It sounds like something out of a fairy story, some defeating injunction laid by a quibbling wizard upon a magic wish. But the point about fairy stories is that their basis is so often universally true. There is a legend about an alchemist who promised to turn any substance into gold provided that no one in his audience thought about a blue monkey. The point might be improved by substituting the condition, provided that no one in the audience thought about the gold. It sounds impossible. But it can be done. It must be done. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. But you must not think about those other things. The point of this book is that it teaches you to look away from your problems instead of at them, and in doing so to find their solution. Just as in looking away from the problem of what I was going to write in this introduction, I have found myself writing it, good or bad. It is not an easy task that it offers but I think it is an essential one. I think that without some understanding of what this book is about, life is just not quite worth living. John Van Vruten Author's Note There is a way whereby we are able to rid ourselves of sin, sickness, poverty, 
the results of wars and economic changes. This way is the exchanging of our material sense of existence for the understanding and consciousness of life as spiritual. Down the centuries, the sense of man and the universe as being material has resulted in the development of fear for the personal self and uh, national existence. This will continue and become even more intensified as more destructive material forces are discovered. The latest announced is one ounce of a chemical which, it is claimed, is sufficient to destroy the entire population of the United States and Canada. This is probably not even the ultimate of material force. There is no material power to overcome either this or the atomic bomb. There is no hope in matter or material sense. The way of security, harmony, and health is through attaining some measure of spiritual consciousness. The great secret is that despite all belief to the contrary, real power, either for good or evil, does not reside in matter or in the material sense of man and the universe. Those who have acquired some degree of spiritual consciousness have proven in that measure the reality of spirit. The necessity for giving up the material sense of existence for the attainment of the spiritual consciousness of life and its activities is the secret of the seers, prophets, and saints of all ages. That it is practical is proven today by the healing and regenerating works done by many students of modern schools of practical or scientific Christianity. When the world learns that whatever success has been gained in improving conditions of health, wealth, and security in the lives of these modern followers of ancient teachings has been accomplished solely by the surrender of material sense through the attainment of spiritual consciousness, it may well look up with hope. The question is, how does one set about to attain this spiritual consciousness? thereby lose the material sense. The answer is, read and study the truths revealed through all ages about the universal mind, soul, or spirit, and about spiritual creation and its laws. Imbibe the spiritual sense of these revelations. In this small volume, I have written the spiritual truth as I have gleaned it through over 30 years of study of the major religions and philosophies of all ages, the last 15 years of which have been spent in the practical application of truth to problems of human existence, problems of health, business, family life, and security. Be assured, inner peace will come as one turns to the spiritual consciousness of life, and an outer calm will follow in one's human affairs. The outer world will conform to the inner awareness of truth. The authority for all of this revelation will be you, as you yourself experience this change within and without. Putting on Immortality In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And the Word was made flesh. The Word was made flesh. But it still is the Word. By being made flesh, it does not change its nature, character, or substance cause becomes visible as effect. 
but the essence or substance is still the word, spirit, or mind. In this wise do we understand that there is not a spiritual universe and a material world, but rather that what appears as our world is the word made flesh, or spirit made visible, or mind expressed as idea. All the error that has existed down the ages is founded on the theory or belief of two worlds. One, the heavenly kingdom, or spiritual life. And the other, a material world, or mortal existence, each separate from the other. In spite of this sense of two worlds, men have always attempted to bring harmony into the discords of human existence through an attempt by prayer to contact this other world or spiritual realm and to bring spirit or God to act upon the so-called material existence. Let us, then, begin with the understanding that our world is not an erroneous one, but rather that the universe in which we live is the realm of reality about which man entertains a false concept. The work of bringing health and harmony into our experience is not, then, getting rid of or even changing a mortal material universe, but in correcting the finite concept of our existence. The seeker of truth starts his search with a problem perhaps with many problems. The first years of his search are devoted to overcoming discords and healing disease through prayer to some higher power or the application of spiritual laws or truth to these mortal conditions. The day arrives, however, when he perhaps discovers that the application of truth to human problems either does not work, or does not work as it once did, or else he finds that there is now less of satisfaction and inspiration in his study. Eventually he has led to the great revelation that mortals only put on immortality as mortality disappears. They do not add immortal, spiritual harmony to human conditions. God does not create, nor does he control material affairs. The natural human man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are spiritually discerned. Are we seeking the things of the Spirit of God for some human purpose? Or are we really endeavoring to put off the mortal? in order that we may behold the harmony of the spiritual realm. While we strive and struggle and contend with the so-called powers of this world, combating sickness and sin or lack, spiritual sense reveals that my kingdom is not of this world. Only as we transcend the desire to improve our humanhood do we understand this vital statement. When, however, we leave the realm of human betterment, we catch the first glimpse of the meaning of I have overcome the world. We have not overcome the world while we are seeking to have less of the world's pains and more of the world's pleasures and profits. And if we are not overcoming the sense of struggle over worldly affairs, we are not entering the realm of heavenly affairs. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. Spiritual consciousness overcomes the world, both the pains and pleasures of the world. We cannot accomplish this evangelization of humanhood by mental might or physical power, but by the spiritual sense of existence which all may cultivate through devotion of thought to things of the Spirit. 
For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. Here is the guide. Watch your thoughts, aims, and ambitions for just a short while, and see if your mind is on your health, pleasures of the senses, or worldly gain. Then, as these worldly thoughts appear, learn to reject them. Because now, we are no longer set on the path of improving our human affairs, but on attaining the spiritual kingdom. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Does this sound as if we were becoming ascetic? Do we appear now to be desiring a life apart from the normal, joyous, successful walks of life? Do not be deceived. Only those who have learned to keep their attention on spiritual things have tasted the full joys of home, companionship, and successful enterprise. Only those who have, in a measure, become centered in God have found safety, security, and peace right in the midst of a war-torn world. Spiritual sense does not remove us from our normal surroundings, nor does it deprive us of the love and companionship so necessary to a full life. It merely places it on a higher level, where it is no longer at the mercy of chance or change or loss, and where the spiritual value of the so-called human scene is made manifest. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. When confronted with any human problem, instead of laboring for an improved human condition, turn from the picture and realize the presence of the Divine Spirit in you. This Spirit dissolves the human seeming and reveals spiritual harmony, though to sight this harmony will appear as improved human health or wealth. When Jesus fed the multitude, it was his spiritual consciousness of abundance that appeared as loaves and fishes. When he healed the sick, it was his feeling of the divine presence that appeared as health, strength, and harmony. This may all be summed up in Paul's words. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We are living in a spiritual universe, but the finite sense has set a picture before us of limitation. While thought is on the picture before us, this world, we are engaged in the constant effort to improve or change it. As soon as we lift our vision... Take thought off what we shall eat and drink and wear. We begin to behold spiritual reality, which appears to us as improved beliefs, but which really is more appearing of reality. This more appearing reality brings with it joys untold here and now, pleasures beyond our wildest imagination and the love of all with whom we come in contact even the love of those who do not know the source of the new life we have discovered. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 
How often do we go on the rocks on this point? How frequently we attempt to understand spiritual wisdom with our human intellect. This leads to mental indigestion. We are attempting to digest spiritual food with our educated mentality. It will not work. Truth is not a reasoning process. Therefore, it must be spiritually discerned. Truth does not, as a rule, appeal to our reason. When it appears to do so, we must search deeply to see if it really is truth. Be suspicious of a truth that seems reasonable. Jesus walking on the water, feeding the multitudes with a few loaves and fishes, healing the sick, and raising the dead. Does all this seem reasonable to you? If the principle underlying these experiences was understood through reason, all the churches would be teaching them as present possibilities, and they would recommend their practice. But this principle is apparent only to spiritual sense. And this cultivated spiritual consciousness can do the things that the Christ has ever done. What was possible to Christ consciousness then is possible to that same consciousness now. We now are engaged in the cultivation of that spiritual sense. And we shall succeed in proportion as we relax our mental struggle and become receptive to those things which the Spirit of God teaches. Instead of trying to make spirit operate upon our human bodies and material affairs, let us turn and disregard these mortal pictures and keep our vision on things above. When we have come down to earth again, we shall find the discords and limitations of sense have disappeared more of reality appearing. The kingdom of God does not consist of more and better matter, nor does it necessarily include a greater vocabulary of truth. Yet the fruitage of spiritual understanding is greater harmony, peace, prosperity, joy, and more ideal companionships and relationships. For this cause also thank we God, without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe, that understand. To receive the word of God or spiritual sense, we need to feel rather than reason. This is referred to biblically as receiving the word in the heart. Note here that the development of the spiritual consciousness results in a greater gift of feeling the harmony of being. We understand that neither seeing, hearing, tasting, touching, nor smelling will reveal spiritual truth or its harmonies to us. Therefore, it must come through a different faculty, the intuitive faculty, which acts through feeling. Heretofore, we have sat down to pray, or to meditate, and immediately a stream of words and thoughts started to flow. Perhaps we began to affirm truth and deny error. You can see that this is wholly in the realm of the human mind, in cultivating our spiritual sense, we become receptive to thoughts which come to us from within. We become hearers of the word rather than speakers. We become so attuned to spirit that we feel the divine harmony of being. We feel the actual presence of God. Having transcended the five physical senses, our intuitive faculty is alert, receptive and responsive, to the things of the Spirit, and we begin our new existence as a result of this spiritual rebirth. Heretofore, we have been concerned with the letter of truth, now only with the Spirit of truth. 
We are not so concerned now with what is truth as with feeling truth. This is accomplished in proportion as we give less thought to the letter and more receptivity to the feel. This word feel, incidentally, refers also to awareness, consciousness, or sense of truth. We are not now speaking truth, but receiving truth. That which we receive in silence, we may speak from the housetops with authority. Spiritual healing is the natural result of a divinely illumined consciousness. We are illumined only as we are receptive and responsive to spiritual illumination. We misunderstand immortality when we think of it as the immortality of the human personality or personal sense. Death does not produce immortality or end personal sense. Neither does the continuation of human existence mean the attainment of immortality. Immortality is attained in proportion as personal sense is overcome, whether here or hereafter. As we put off the personal ego and attain the consciousness of our real self, the reality of us, divine consciousness, we attain immortality, and that can be achieved here and now. The desire to perpetuate our false sense of body and wealth ensnares us into death or mortality. The first step in the attainment of immortality is living out from the center of our being as in the idea of unfoldment from within rather than accretion. It is the giving sense rather than getting, being rather than attaining. In this consciousness there is no condemning, judging, hating, or fearing, but rather a continuous feeling of love and forgiving. It is not a simple matter to show forth the joy and peace of immortality, because to those intent on preserving their present concepts of being, immortality would appear to be extinction. This is not the case. It is the eternal preservation of all that is real, fine, noble, harmonious, gracious, unselfish, and peaceful. It is reality brought to light in place of the illusion of sense. It is the conscious awareness of the infinity of individual being, replacing the finite sense of existence. Selfishness and conceit fall away in the realization of the divinity of our being. This realization brings forth patience and forbearance with those still struggling in mortal material consciousness. It is being in the world, but not of it. Spiritual Illumination Spiritual illumination enables us to discern the spiritual reality where the human concept appears to be. Material sense sees what it believes and then believes what it sees. Spiritual sense discerns the reality of that which is appearing as concept. The development of spiritual consciousness begins with our first realization that what we are beholding through sight, hearing, tasting, touching, and smelling is not the reality of things. Disregarding appearances entirely, the first ray of spiritual illumination brings us hints of the divine, the eternal and immortal. This, in turn, makes the appearance even less real to us thereby admitting even greater illumination. Our progress spiritward is in proportion to the illumination which enables us to behold more and more of reality. Because the human scene is entirely misconception through misperception, any thought of helping, healing, or correcting, or changing the material picture must be relinquished in order that we may see the ever-present reality. 
spiritual illumination has come to us in a measure with our first investigation of truth. We believed that we were seeking good or truth, whereas the light was beginning to shine in our consciousness, compelling us to take the steps we have since taken. Every increase of our spiritual understanding was more light appearing and dispelling the darkness of sense. This inflow of illumination will continue until we come to the full realization of our true identity as the light of the world. Without illumination, we struggle with the forces of the world. We labor for a living. We struggle to maintain our place and position. We compete for riches or honors. Often we war with our own friends and even find ourselves at war with ourselves. There is no security in personal possessions, even after the battle to acquire them has been won. Illumination brings first peace, then confidence and assurance. It brings rest from the world's contests, and then all good flows to us through grace. We see now that we do not live by acquiring, gaining, or achieving. We live by grace. We possess all as the gift of God. We do not get our good. We already have all good. Son, all that I have is thine. The pleasures and successes of the world are as nothing compared with the joys and treasures which now unfold to us through spiritual sense. In the light of truth, the greatest earthly happiness and triumph is as nothing, whereas the treasures of soul have a glory unknown and unfathomed by sense. Possessing the divine light within him, man gains his freedom from the world and security from all earthly or human dangers. This period holds terrors and fears for many. The spiritually illumined will recognize that because no good can come or go, that because spiritual activity is always of the nature of fulfillment, that because their illumination has revealed the reality of things, they are anchored in soul, in God consciousness, in spiritual peace, security, and serenity. We will fear no change in the outer picture because the outer is but the reflection of the allness within. Safe in the realization that we are individual, though infinite, spiritual consciousness embodying all good, we need give no consideration to the evidence of the senses. Spiritual illumination reveals the harmony of being and dispels the evidence of material sense. It does not change anything in the universe, for this is a spiritual universe, peopled with children of God. But the illumination changes our concept of the universe. This is but the beginning of this vast subject. While we are on it, let us keep thought removed as far as possible from the world of sense, and anchored in the conscious awareness of spiritual reality. Always there have appeared men bearing the divine message of the presence of God and of the unreality of evil, Buddha of India, Lao Tse of China, Jesus of Nazareth. These and many others brought the light of truth to men, and always men have interpreted this light as the messenger failing to see that what they were beholding as a man out there was the light of truth within their own consciousness. In worshiping Jesus, men lost the Christ. In devotion to Jesus, men failed to apprehend the Christ. In seeking good through Jesus, men failed to find the omnipresent Christ in their own consciousness. In every case, the messenger appearing to man is the advent of the Christ in individual consciousness, and when so understood, freedom from personal sense 
and personal limitation has been attained. Jesus said, If I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. Was this not clear enough for all to understand? If you do not look away from the personal sense of salvation, mediation, and guidance, you will not find the great light within your own consciousness. Spiritual illumination does not come from a person, but from the impersonal Christ, the universal truth, the illumined consciousness of yourself. Illumined consciousness dispels the personal sense of self with its problems, ills, ages, and failures. It reveals the real self, the I that I am, unlimited, unfettered, untroubled, harmonious, and free. This selfhood is revealed as we retire within ourselves each day and they learn to listen and to watch. Likewise, instead of anxious care about the work of the day or the events of the future, we let the soul or our divine spirit go ahead of us to smooth and prepare the way. We let this divine influence remain behind us to safeguard every step from the illusions of sense. Illumined consciousness always knows that there is an infinite, all-powerful presence prospering every act and blessing every thought. It knows that all who touch us on life's highway must feel the benediction of our thought. When consciousness is afire with truth and love, it destroys all sense of fear, doubt, hate, envy, disease, and discord. And this pure consciousness is felt by all whom we meet and it lightens the load they carry. It is impossible to be the light of the world and not dispel the darkness of those about us. Realize that all the good you experience is the shining forth of your own consciousness, even when it appears to come from or through some other individual. Recognize every ap evil appearance as a false perception of harmony, therefore not to be feared or hated, this will result in the disappearance of the illusion and the showing forth of reality. Only illumined consciousness can look upon an evil appearance and perceive the divine reality. Only the Christ in consciousness can strip error of its seeming reality and rob it of its sting. Spiritual illumination reveals that we are not mortals, not even humans, but that we are pure spiritual being, divine consciousness, self-sustaining life, all-inclusive mind. This light destroys the illusion of personal sense. Illumination dissolves all material ties and binds men together with the golden chains of spiritual understanding. It acknowledges only the leadership of the Christ. It has no ritual or rule but the divine, impersonal, universal love. No other worship than the inner flame that is ever lit at the shrine of spirit. This union is the free state of spiritual brotherhood. The only restraint is the discipline of soul. Therefore, we know liberty without license. We are a united universe without physical limits, a divine service to God without ceremony or creed. The illumined walk without fear by grace. To know that we are the fulfillment of God that we are that place in consciousness where God shines through, is to be spiritually minded. The realization that every individual is the presence of God, that all that is is God appearing, is spiritual consciousness. The understanding that what we see, hear, taste, touch, or smell through the five physical senses is but the finite concept of reality and in no wise related to the spiritually real 
a spiritual sense. Christ consciousness beholds God everywhere, shining through the mist of personal sense. It recognizes no sinner to be reformed, no sick to heal, no poor to enrich. Spiritual illumination dispels the false concepts or images of finite sense and reveals all being as God appearing. The light in individual consciousness reveals the world of God's creating, the universe of reality, the children of God. In this light, the mortal scene disappears. The world of concepts, this world, gives place to my kingdom, the reality of things seen as they are. Likewise, there is always the sense of an inner companionship. We feel an inner warmth, a living presence, a divine assurance. Sometimes we feel a strong hand in ours or behold a smiling face over our shoulder. We are never alone and we know it. This sweet presence gives us an inner rest. It enables us to relax from the strain of the world and brings us the joy of peace. In truth, it is a peace be still to every problem or strain of human existence. It is a healing influence within us, and yet it is felt by all those about us. This inner presence of which we are aware is truth itself, interpreting itself to us as presence, power, companion, Christ, light, peace, and healing influence. The consciousness of this inner being is the result of our greater illumination, of our cultivated spiritual consciousness. Truth is the God who healeth our diseases, and it goes ever before us to make smooth our path in life. This truth is wealth and appears as our abundant supply. No human circumstance or condition can lessen our income and wealth while we abide in this consciousness of the presence of love. Establish this truth within you, and it becomes your real being, knowing neither birth nor death, youth nor age, health nor disease, but only the eternality of harmonious being. This truth dispels every illusion of sense and reveals the infinite harmony of your being. It dispels mortality and reveals your immortality. Whatever in your thought is unlike this divine presence, truth itself must yield in order that you may drink the pure water of life and eat the spiritual meat of truth. To free our hearts from the errors of self, self-will, false desires, ambitions, and greed is to reflect the light of truth as the perfect diamond reflects its own inner light. About 500 B.C. it was written, it easily happens that a man, when taking a bath, steps upon a wet rope and imagines that it is a snake. Horror will overcome him, and he will shake from fear, anticipating in his thought all the agonies caused by the serpent's venomous bite. What a relief does this man experience when he sees that the rope is no snake. The cause of his fright lies in his error, his ignorance, his illusion. If the true nature of the rope is recognized, his tranquility of mind will come back to him. He will feel relieved. He will be joyful and happy. This is the state of mind of one who has recognized that there is no personal self, that the cause of all his troubles, cares, and vanities is a mirage, a shadow, a dream. So again, illumination reveals that there is no error, 
that what appears as the snake, sin, disease, discord, death, is reality itself, misperceived by finite sense. Then discords are not to be hated, feared, or resented, but reinterpreted until the true nature of the rope, reality, is discerned through spiritual sense. The snake, disease, or discord is a state of mind merely with no corresponding external reality. It must be understood that no illusion is or ever can be externalized. Spiritual illumination may be attained by living constantly in the consciousness of the presence of perfection, by the continual translation of the visible picture into the reality. We are being faced with discordant appearances all through our days and nights. These must immediately be translated through our understanding of the new tongue, the language of spirit. Every incident of our daily experience offers fresh opportunities to use our spiritual understanding. Each use of the spiritual faculties results in greater spiritual perception, which in turn reveals more and more of the light of truth. Pray without ceasing, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Translate the pictures and incidents of daily existence into the new tongue, the language of spirit, and consciousness will expand until translation occurs without even taking thought. It becomes an habitual state of consciousness, a constant awareness of truth. Only in this wise can we find our lives unfolding harmoniously from the center of our being, without taking conscious thought. Instead of our existence being a continual round of demonstrations, it becomes the natural, harmonious, joyous unfoldment of good. Instead of repeated efforts to make good come to us, our every good unfolds to view without conscious effort, either physical or mental, from the depths of our own being. We are no longer dependent on person or circumstance, nor even on our personal effort. Spiritual illumination enables us to relax our personal efforts and rely more and more on divinity, unfolding and revealing itself as us.